on BYUSN. Does BYU football's bowl eligibility really hinge on a win or loss tomorrow night against ECU? Plus, our first look at BYU hoops. Mark Pope rolls out the new kids on the block. I like that band, Dave. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. I am Spencer Linton. To my left sits the fabulous Dave McKinn. Can we call the new kids on the block a band? Are, are, are they the first boy band? Well, I think they were. Now they're the old kids on the block. They're still playing in Vegas. So I think you can call them whatever they want. But, uh, but they can still sing it. And now we got literally the new kids on the block here in Provo. That was, that was your era, right? That was when you were thriving. Yeah. Sports, Something Vegas, like new kids on the block. I'm not exactly sure when the new kids were around because we're more into the Rolling Stones and things <laughs> okay. like that. But, uh, but they popped up and then they've never left. So they must have been okay. Hey, an early shout out to Donnie Wahlberg. <laughs> Here's what we got coming up on this show. Speaking to the new kids on the block, what, yeah. we, what we liked. And some of the cool moments were from Rudy Williams, one of the new kids on the block, former defensive end. Hans Olsen is going to be with us talking about defense, offense, and, and uh, what he'd like to see different come tomorrow night. Jimmer taking on the world, three on three. If Love there's it. anybody that can do Love it. Love it. He can do it. And a tennis tag team on the way to the Nationals. Here are today's headlines. Let's start with football game day eve, shall we? BYU, maybe you've heard, under the Friday night lights at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, will host ECU in what has become an intensely important game. We'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes. 8 Eastern tomorrow night, tight end Isaac Rex, hoping to be more involved in the passing game, but he says the key to BYU's offensive success may be a more physical approach. Yeah, we have to get back to being physical. I mean, if you look back at some of the games last year, Arizona State, Utah, we were running the ball. We were pounding guys where there was pancakes all over. And we have to get back to that, especially up front. And that starts with um, me, the offensive line, running backs. You know, we have to be able to, to run the ball. Yeah, do it now. Run the ball, stop the run. It's that simple, right? No one cares how physical the team is in February. It's got to be tonight. BYU Hoops, speaking of tonight, or last night, held their blue-white scrimmage on BYU TV. The white team, led by Coastal Carolina transfer Rudy Williams, game high 19 points, beat the blue squad 78-65. Arkansas transfer Jackson Robinson had 16 points, and Dallin Hall with nine points, three of those coming off of his own defensive play. I love that he's like, you know what? I'm going to go match that. I'm going to go put some weight on and match that. How about that block? Dallin Hall with the block. Now the three. Stop it. My goodness. I How mean, good is Dallin Hall? He's going to be fun to watch. Oh, man. Love the way that kid plays. Serious tenacity. Uh, we mentioned uh, a little bit of basketball from BYU. Why not continue with Jimmer for debt yeah. as we dive into the details there? USA Basketball announcing the 2022 three-on-three -three AmeriCup rosters. And yes, his Jimmerness is involved. They will attend training camp from Halloween through November 3rd in Miami Lakes, Florida, before competing at the 2022 FIBA three-on-three -three America, set for November 4th through the 6th in Miami. Four less guys on the floor gives him more room to do his thing. 17th ranked women's volleyball hosting Gonzaga tonight's big one for a variety of reasons. One, the Cougars looking to snap a two-game skid. You can see it at 9 Eastern time on BYU TV and the BYU TV app. Let's go. That's why I've got my volleyball sweatshirt on today. They need support. Let's do it. And how about some tennis? BYU's men's team heads to Texas for the Rice Fall Challenge to cap off their fall season. Begins today, runs through Saturday. Good luck to the BYU men. All rise and shout. Once again, it's time for What's Trending. And we go right back to BYU football, Dave. Four and four, three-game losing streak. <sighs> Have we really come to this point where BYU and their bowl eligibility may be on the line in tomorrow night's game? What do you think? Does BYU's bowl eligibility hinge on a win or loss tomorrow night against East Carolina? It feels like it. It feels like it because they don't know who they are. They find themselves, especially early in that game, uh, and then all of a sudden you beat East Carolina, and then, then you got a shot at beating Boise State. They're not world beaters, but they'll beat a team that doesn't know who they are. And then Stanford at the, at the end of the month. So Utah Tech's in there too. They need two wins to get bowl eligible. It does feel like because of their inability to kind of know who they are, that, that all of that self-identity resurrection stuff rides on tomorrow night. Now, based on the football power index from ESPN, it is clear that the ECU game is the most winnable of the remaining three FBS foes. And it's because BYU's playing at home. Yeah. 
where they've been way better. It's a night game. We've chronicled that ad nauseum, how much better BYU has been under the lights. But 56% chance BYU has to beat East Carolina at Lavelle Edwards Stadium tomorrow night. If Boise State and Stanford were playing at East Carolina, I would pick East Carolina to beat those two teams. Absolutely. The Pirates have been so good at home. Yeah, but they're here, and that's different. They got to travel the two time zones on a short week and play in mid 40s. And maybe that's a weird thing. Couple that with BYU and the confidence that they have when they play at night. I don't know. I feel like it's just. Throwing Halloween weekend. You know, just add that in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please don't dress up as a pirate, BYU fans. Yeah. Okay, don't do, you, don't do Johnny that. Johnny Depp can be on Monday. Has it come to the point where we're that fickle where it's like, yeah, like there's a mental edge to BYU playing at night? I think we've gotten there, Dave. Like, I, whatever, whatever BYU needs. You go there. Like, if that's what they have to hang their hat on, we don't lose at home at night, great. The numbers don't lie. It's incredible. It's incredible the difference between day and night with this football team. And, uh, and when and we do that, we bring the numbers together, and it's like, wow. I don't know how the team feels about that stuff. I don't even know if they chart these kinds of things, but we do, and it's impressive. And you don't want to play BYU at night. No. Especially in Provo. And you know what? We're, look at these. Look at, look at the defensive effort. After dark. I love this. Defense after dark. BYU's giving up just 21 points a game when they play at night. Total defense, 309 yards. Compare that to the other games where BYU is surrendering 531 plus yards per game. Pass defense significantly better by 113 yards per game. And the rush, the yards per rush, over two yards per rush better when you're playing defense at night. It just, it's insane, but there's something there. All those numbers feed the energy in the stadium. You gotta give a shout out to The Rock because at night they've, they've had a few Sprites and a few Cougar Tails and sugar content is sky high. They're different. Everything's different at night. The Rock, that, that student section gets energized and jacked up. We saw it affect how many games? You know, you go back to Arizona State last year, Utah last year, earlier this year. Teams have a hard time playing in that end of the stadium when the Rock's engaged and it's at night. So you got to factor them in as the 12th man, 13th or 14th. Maybe they need 15 this, this weekend. But uh, I, I, I like it because, you know, we grew up with day games. And then all of a sudden night games came around. It's like, ooh, the energy here. I remember the first night game at Wrigley Field. It didn't feel right, but it was cool. It was special. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey. We can play in 65 degrees instead of 95 degrees. Let's do that. And then all of a sudden, night games became a thing, at least in our world. And now, now it's a rarity that you play in the afternoon. You almost have to play on BYU TV to play in the afternoon, like the Utah Tech game at 1.30 coming up uh, November 19th. But, um, hey, I think it's, thank goodness it's at night. Sure. Yeah. I know that the time of day and the time of game does not win a game. But, my goodness, these statistics are eye-popping. Uh, and even under Kalani Sataki on Friday in general, BYU's 8-3 uh, with Coach Sataki at the helm. ECU 5-11 and in their last 16 on Friday nights, which is also worth noting, right? And yeah. they're playing on the road, and the Pirates, again, as good as they've been, they got a great quarterback, really capable, solid offense. They don't play relatively well away from home. No. And they got to come to cold weather. So all the elements are in place away from the actual combat to favor BYU. Then they kick it off, and someone's got to tackle somebody. Someone's got to catch a ball. Yes. Someone's got to make a right play call at the right time. And then that's how you, you know. But, but all the elements are in place to help this team help itself. BYU will become bowl eligible in a de facto sort of way if they beat ECU on Friday night. Uh, because they're going to beat Utah Tech. Right. They will have six wins. You beat ECU... You have essentially guaranteed yourself six wins and you're going to be playing in the college football bowl season. Beat ECU tomorrow night. You should go beat Boise State and you should go beat Stanford because th this is the, the, the like we, we talked about earlier, this, the, the team that won all those games leading up to Friday night is the same team that's lost the last three. We just, just got to get them reminded that you, oh, can wait win. A sec. you can win a game. We're BYU and we're actually pretty good. And so why not go beat those teams? They're not world beaters. Um, but, but if they lose tomorrow, you know, then, then 
Well, kind of like what we've had the last few weeks. You yeah. Know, weeping and wailing and mourning and, and everything's <laughs> wrong in the world. All it's going to take us a one point win tomorrow night. We're just like, you know what? I think we're going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Five Let's go and get four. Boise. Five and four. Yeah. You're going to be bowl eligible to beat Utah Tech. And then there is hope restored for sure that maybe BYU can string something together and go and beat Boise State. Confidence is such a fickle beast. Yeah. And that's what is fascinating about fans because. Um, we're not playing the game, but our emotions are in the game, and our emotions are all weak. And uh, even even last night, depending on what you were looking at it in the in the blue-white game, if you were expecting Jimmer Fredette to come out and all those other guys, well, then you left going, I can't believe Jimmer Fredette. We're, we're terrible. We don't have this and that. But if you're looking at, hey, what do we got? It's the start of a new journey with these guys and these personalities. Then all of a sudden you get engaged and, and you enjoy the ride as a fan. BYU fans in football have enjoyed the ride. Um, but, uh, but losses are, man, losses are the worst. I sent out a poll question yesterday to kind of gauge where BYU football fans are mentally. And yeah. I gave them four options. I said, okay, where are you mentally right now? Are you buying into Kalani? Like he's going to fix it. BYU is going to go eight and four. They're going to win the back four in the regular season. Or are you of the mindset of whatever, just get bowl eligible. And then the, there are the options of essentially, uh, I've given up on this season. I'm in the <laughs> fan transfer portal. And then I'm still mad about Liberty, right? Yeah, yeah. So surprisingly, um, 23% of the responses, and there were a good number of votes, said, I believe in Kalani to, to turn this thing around, eight and four. And I thought, man, I, I appreciate the hope and optimism of BYU. But why not? Why not? We expect him to be 10 and two. Like, I, and I will say this. I am hanging my hat on his ability in week two calling the defensive yeah. plays to get his guys right. Even with all the injuries... With all the guys out, the linebacking core is going to look a lot different this Friday night. They're super banged up. Peyton Wilgar, we don't know if Max Tooley's going to play. I get it, but this is week two of Kalani Satake calling the plays and running the show on defense. And when Bronco Mendenhall did that in 2010 and 2014, it typically took a couple of weeks before you started to see the difference in the defense. And I expect that will happen tomorrow night in, in line with the night game. And all of the metrics and all the good stuff that goes along there with playing at home in the cold temperatures, ECU happened to travel two time zones, and BYU being historically good on Friday night yeah. under the lights. Just imagine the energy in the stadium if BYU has a three and out on oh, defense. Oh, man. Oh, my In the good. first quarter. Oh, my goodness. Think about this. So East Carolina comes out. They got the ball, and they get three plays, and then the punter has to come out. That moment alone... <laughs> <laughs> might be the large, just because of how it's gone the last weeks, might be the largest yes. applause of the night. Yeah. I want BYU fans to cheer <laughs> as equally loud for a third down stop as they do for scoring points tomorrow night because third down stops have been few and far between. It feels easier to score points right now for BYU than it does to get a third down stop, which is nuts. We talked about 23 and 1 in games after 6 p.m. since 2019. If you just start that fact in 2020, 19-0 in games that start after 6 p.m. local time. We're starting at 6.05 local time tomorrow night. <laughs> so we got that going for us, we, which is nice. We slid the kick time back five <laughs> minutes just to make sure that it's in that If we window. were ever about to kick out before 6, someone just hit the power, and then we'll just wait a couple minutes and sure. power back up. But th there is, uh, you know, the numbers don't lie, and uh, I, th I think it's energy. And, uh, and, and focus and, and excitement, which BYU has not had, sure. didn't have it in the Notre Dame game, although the crowd tried to do it, tried to do it against Arkansas, but once they fell behind, it was just the air left. And then last week was, we're still not sure, sure which sure. team that was. I do need to say this. There were a few people that sent me messages uh, on the social media platforms that said, Spencer, it doesn't matter. When this, this team is in such a funk, it doesn't matter. The night, the whole thing, it'll be interesting to see. If, if, again, this, this night game dominance is restored, even with a three-game losing streak and BYU seemingly bottoming out right now. Well, well Hans Olsen's coming up. Let's ask him. I'm fascinated by this game. Let's ask him if Friday night felt different yes. for the guys. I'm so fascinated by this game. Yeah. Can't wait for it. You know, the, the beauty of these games is they're six and seven days apart. And so by the time you go through the five stages of emotion, <laughs> whether you won or lost, we you get back around to Friday or, and all of a sudden it's like, it's time for another game. Uh, yeah, I've reached acceptance. Let's go. I'm in acceptance <laughs> mode right now. All right, our second big topic on this, on this day. Uh, the, what were your impressions of the scrimmage last night? We called it on BYU TV. Uh, there was a lot of fun. There was a little energy in the arena. There was sure. a good crowd on hand. It was free. They could just show up or they could stay home and watch it. And 
and I was so curious to see what all these guys were going to look like. It was exactly what I expected it to be, yeah. which is just defensive chaos, <laughs> sloppy, a lot of effort, a lot of sprinting up and down the floor, blocked shots, because we've heard about this for the past yeah. few weeks and few months, for that matter, from Mark Pope. He loves the length of his team. He loves the speed that they play at. He loves their energy. He says that our conditioning is going to be elite when it comes to you know, BYU compared to the rest of Division I teams. So it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. Just sloppy, chaos, fun, up and down. It was, yeah, it was really good. I like the defensive chaos and defensive energy that, that BYU is going to play with this year. It's not going to be beautiful basketball, Dave. No, but they showed some full-court press, which I like. It was interesting. And they've got some speed to do it uh, and, and, uh, and length in the arms. Not very tall, but they're, but they're long. Um, and you say, well, what does that even mean? Well, for Foose is 6'5", but when he puts his hands up, now he's... Now he's seven one, yeah, you know, yeah. and then he can jump. So that 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 length really matters, especially in in a, in a zone press and, and just playing basic defense. Sure, and I want to point out a couple of specific defensive plays in this defensive yeah. chaos. Uh, there was a scenario, and I was I happened to be uh, giving a report on Trey Stewart when this happened, right. talking about pickle juice and Powerade. That's the kind of night it was. Those guys were right? cramping up. They were cramping up, so pickle juice was... And then Gideon George blocks a shot and then follows it up about a second and a half later and blocks another shot. Yeah. And I just thought, I like this. Again, it's not like the most beautiful style of basketball, but maybe you ask the BYU coaches and they think it's beautiful and the way that it's muddied up. And it's Winning just, is beautiful. Absolutely. I think uh, winning ugly is so much better than losing nicely. I, I love the block shots. Dallin Hall, tell you what, I really, really like what he's going to do for BYU basketball. Um, uh, he was the player that I aspired to be when I was playing high school basketball, right? Just the way he plays with toughness defensively, no fear on offense. Right. But he had a sequence where he blocks a shot at the rim and snags that ball, mouth guard in his mouth, down the floor, pull up, transition three, knocks it down. Super confident player. I love what he's doing along with the other two return missionary freshmen, Richie Saunders and Tanner Toulson. They just kind of play with no fear. And yeah. the moment's not too big. And I really, really like that. I don't know what the season's going to be, Dave. Right. BYU well, you might win 18 games. They might win 22 games. Um, but I tell you what, it's going to be a battle every time you take the floor against BYU because they will go high energy the entire game. And fans want to see effort. You know, I think one thing about the Liberty football game is fans hated the effort. It looked like there was no effort. Um, so a basketball team that, that's going to show effort uh, for, 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 what, 35 games or whatever, well, that's must-see TV. I want to see what the guys are going to do tonight. And So you're right. I, I, I love that for a lot of those guys, it was the first time they had a BYU yeah. jersey on. It was the first time, first time they were playing in front of people since their missions or, or since there were other schools they were at. So it was their first taste of BYU basketball, and, and I thought that was, that was cool. We got an exhibition game next week, and we'll see how they work their lineup. Sometimes there is power in playing with unknown expectations. And BYU men's basketball doesn't have a ton of, like, set-in-stone expectations. We're all kind of just like, well, let's just see what happens. Yeah. And sometimes that can be hugely advantageous. We do know what it's like to play with expectations <laughs> that are enormous, <laughs> even insane. Uh, and, and that's what the football team Yeah, I was going to say, you couldn't be referencing BYU football right now, could you? <laughs> uh, let's go to Voice of the Nation. Our question of the day is this. Does BYU football need to beat ECU on Friday night to feel comfortable about making a bowl game? Ben Peterson on Twitter answers, yes, right now, this looks like the most winnable game outside of Utah Tech. And ESPN would agree with you, Ben. He continues, as we have learned this year, away games are a much more difficult prospect. 56% chance to beat ECU, and then under 40% chance to beat Boise State on the blue and win on the farm at Stanford. 38.5% and 39.7, respectively, in those two final road games. Massive game. I just, just so, so fascinating and kind of scary. And there's some trepidation, but super, super intriguing. Love well, it. And that's what we're going to watch. Yes. Hashtag BYUSN to join that conversation. BYU Sports Nation game day, 6 Eastern tomorrow on BYU TV. Out at the stadium, getting ready to roll two hours of coverage. We'll sit down with Tyler Batty and talk about all those defensive woes that we're about to talk with Pan Olson about. Yeah, will you bring that barbecue, Dave? Good night for barbecue tomorrow night. Uh, there is the man. Hans Olsen is back. Does he believe BYU can fix their issues 
in six days time. Looks like he's teaching seminary this, this morning. This is BYU Sports Nation. What a handsome man he is. <laughs> Stay with us. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by the Tim Daly Auto Group, serving Utah since 1968. When you think of BYU, <laughs> you probably don't think about high school. Of the Constant Wonder Podcast. Can't just come to the building and, and think that that's enough. We can really become better because of this. Let's return back to who we are. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Alongside Dave McCann, I'm Spencer Linton. You just heard Kalani Satake's voice. He also said, from these type of circumstances, heroes are born. <laughs> and I like that emotion yeah. going into the game against CCU because BYU, frankly, needs a hero. Uh, we're going to bring on a hero of sorts uh, in our lives. Friend of the program, Hans Olsen, is with us on BYU Sports Nation, looking very sharp in a tie. Hans, I think everyone is wondering... How in the world BYU writes this ship, my friend? Uh, you have spoken a lot about that uh, to your specific audience, and certainly BYU fans on BYU Sports Nation want to hear what you think about this. But what's the most fixable thing for BYU this week? Well, two things start defensively. Number one, if you can just fix contain, that is going to do a world of good for you and your team. Fix, contain. There are a couple of factual things that you'll never be able to escape from football. There's a couple of truths, football truths. One of them is you must contain. Every play, there has to be contained responsibility. For one reason or the other, BYU has continued to lose contain. So fix, contain. That's number one. Number two, on any run down in distances, Anything that could be perceived as a run down a distance. Make sure your linebackers are on their toes and ready to come downhill and meet a lineman to stop the run. Those are the two most disappointing things for me. Now, there's some physicality issues and there's even some athlete to athlete issues. But the two most disappointing things for me, controlling contain because I can control contain. And number two, getting on your toes and coming downhill as a linebacker to meet in the gap and make sure that that run game is shut down. Those two things, Spencer, have to change coming up on Friday night. Hans, let's go back to, to your playing days, and you had to deal with adversity as well. And, and when your defense would huddle up uh, and no one's quite sure who's going to make the play, how lonely of a feeling is that? And how quick can someone turn the switch and say, you know what, this week I'm going to do it? It can, it can turn, and you came in with a cut from Kalani saying this is where heroes are found. And Kalani was a hero back in my day. Uh, Kalani and I were the same class together and played for three years after he got back from his mission together. And Kalani was one of those guys in the offensive huddle that could turn things around. And Rob Morris, for those that remember the freight train, he was in our huddle, and he was very direct, didn't pull punches, made sure that everybody understood what he thought about them, what he thought about their performance, and what this defense needed to do. There were some other great characters in our huddle. Uh, Chris Oak was a fantastic uh, huddle guy. Byron Frisch was a great huddle guy. Shane Muirbrook, if you go back to that 96 Cotton Bowl team, was uh, a leader that really poured down. And so, Dave, it can change. It can change really fast when you find the right voice. Somebody's got to have the voice. And I, I don't know where Max Tooley is with his injury. You know, Peyton Wilgard might have been that voice last year. You would hope that Keenan Peely could be a voice like that. Uh, you'd hope that Tyler Batty could be a voice like that. Somebody has to step up and vocalize what needs to be done and, and enforce it. Now, for what it's worth, Hans, you brought up Tyler Batty. He has called out his teammates when I interviewed him last Saturday night and said, look, it's all on the players. And he's been vocal early this week in team meetings as well. So maybe there's something there. Uh, I tend to agree with you. He seems like the personality and type that could be a team leader there. But the fact that we're at this point of the season, going into game number nine, and we're still wondering who the emotional leaders are on this team, 
is, some, is disconcerting. I mean, how much of an impact does that have on a locker room when you don't know where to look for that type of emotional and vocal leader? If you don't have one that's a staple that that you've relied on, it it can be really difficult. But that doesn't mean that one can't appear. That doesn't mean that one can't surface. Guys can come around and they can make an impact. And, you know, one thing that I saw, Spencer, in this game, I saw that Kalani was making some decisions to put some freshmen out on the field. And it's almost like he's looking for that guy. He's looking for the guy that steps up, makes a couple of big plays, forces a fumble, stuffs up a gap, gets a nice stop on a third and one to get the defense off the field. I feel like he's kind of searching for those. Those guys actually can surface and can make an impact when when you find them. And all it takes is one big game that then compounds and compounds. They can find that voice. Go back to uh, Lavelle's last couple of games, talking about pressure and the need to, uh, to turn things around really fast. You got New Mexico here in the home finale, Lavelle's last game, and they have Utah and Salt Lake City to, to finish it out. You need two wins to avoid a losing season for Lavelle. This is a football team that needs to find itself and get a win tomorrow to, to improve their chances on, on the postseason. But are there similarities as, as you took the field against the Lobos at 4-6 four and six, and these guys take the field tomorrow night at 4-4? Four and four? Yeah, there, there are a lot of similarities. And, and, you know, I remember that moment and that year, we all wanted to give Lavelle a great send-off. And we were all heartbroken with a couple of early losses. You know, we started that season out with Florida State in the Jacksonville Stadium. And I remember they had that schedule just stacked for Lavelle's last year. And we, we really did want to give him a send-off. And when we lost that Florida State game, it was like, well, there goes the big, big send-off. And then we let it slide a little bit. But then we all came together. We said, no, we're not doing this, this losing season stuff. So we were able to get that win against New Mexico. And that was the day that they named the stadium after Lavelle. So there was a lot of energy and emotion in that stadium. And then Lavelle's last miracle at Rice Eccles Stadium against Utah is a game that I'll never forget. That I'm sure BYU fans will forget that we were all able to come together. And there were some miracle plays in that game that led to some big things and a great finish and a finish that we all felt proud of and a finish that we felt like at least we could send LaBelle off with this energy and this effort. And it made a difference for us. Former BYU defensive standout Hans Olsen is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Incredible radio personality. He's wearing a tie just for our show today because he's that type of guy. It's not even 11 a.m. <laughs> he's got a tie. <laughs> I thought, I thought this was formal. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about the unbelievable dominance that BYU has had over the past few seasons when playing at home under the lights. And I don't want to just put it on that, but do you feel like there's something extra there? Like that there's magic in the air at night at Lavelle Edwards Stadium and that all of a sudden will give BYU a better chance to beat ECU tomorrow night? Well, I would say that, but... I went to that Baylor game, and I, that was as much magic as I've ever felt in that stadium. Uh, I don't remember exactly what time it kicked off, but I i got to tell you, I was right there on the sideline or right by the sideline, and there was an insane amount of energy in that atmosphere. So the record shows that, and I might be the opponent that they play in the evening. I always love playing under the lights, if you're asking for my – uh, specific interest. I always love playing under lights. I love those evening and night games. But, and they were rare back in my day, but I I have never felt a, a more palpable energy in that stadium than I did against, uh, when they were playing against Baylor. It was high energy, man. That, that stadium is so beautiful and it's so unique and those fans are so powerful. And they really did help lead BYU to a win against that Baylor team. You know, because you bring this up, Spencer and Dave, I wanted to talk about this because it's a concern of mine. You've got a couple of pretty tough losses under your belt. And you've been on the road in some tough games and some tough losses. And BYU fans, I can feel it. You guys can feel it. I can feel it. 
there's this bubbling energy of, of anger and disappointment. I'm worried that if there's two or three bad defensive series in this game against East Carolina, that the fans that are in that stadium are going to turn on this team. And they're going to start booing, and they're going to start jeering, and, and it's going to turn. I almost feel like it'd be better for BYU to be on the road against ECU because at least you get the fans cheering and you don't get this negative ball of home energy if things do fail defensively. And as you guys mentioned about the offensive stats for ECU, there's a good chance that ECU is going to get a couple of drives going early. I hope that this stadium can stay together. I hope that the fans can support and and really encourage because let's say they get down by 10 in the first half against ECU. Fan encouragement in the second half might be the difference for the comeback and the win. So I'm not enforcing anything, and I'm not telling people that I'll be completely disappointed. I'm just saying I see it on the horizon. I, I know what happens in these moments. Be ready for ECU to score early and be ready to support and keep, and keep encouragement behind this team because there's nothing – at this point, there's not much they can do. They can't, they're not going to start firing guys. They're trying to put in freshmen and they're trying to find their balance. And it could be ugly at parts in this, in this game, but it'd be nice to be a BYU football player back in pads on that sideline or on that field. And instead of fi- feeling like the fans have turned on me – feeling like the fans are still behind me and they're still expecting great things. And I, I hope that they're able to find some of that in this game coming up on Friday. Well said. Hans Olsen with us on BYU Sports Nation. Hans, always great to catch up with you, man. Uh, we look forward to a very, very intriguing game against East Carolina tomorrow night. We'll talk again soon. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Let's go. The man dressing up just for the show, Dave. He's that's that's what he on. does. He's got his game face what on, he that's does. for sure. Well, another big game tonight. This one in the volleyball floor. 17th ranked BYU trying to snap a two game skid. Gonzaga is here for the last time. Yeah, it kind of feels like it might be, right? Yeah. Unless there's a non conference thing, but yeah. it's going to be the last time the Zags are in the Smith Fieldhouse. 9 Eastern time tonight on BYU TV. Uh, and I have a question for all of you Has Jimmer Fredette just become the face of a version of the Redeem team? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This is BYU Sports Nation. To interact with the show and get great content throughout the day, follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Dave McCann. I am Spencer Linton. Let's whip it. Cougar Whip Round presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Dave, start us off. ECU offensive coordinator Donnie Kirkpatrick said the following about BYU fans. Quote, they're really nice when you get there, <laughs> and then they get rowdy. What's he saying? Is he is that an insult, or is it just <laughs> they're, they're really nice, and then they then they get the get into the game? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's an insult, but... Uh, I, I think that there is there's something to that. Like, hey, don't let don't let their uh, smiles and kindness fool you. Like, when the football game starts, the fans are gonna bring it. Yeah, at least he didn't say they're nice, and then they start throwing car batteries. Yeah, at you. exactly. None of that. None of that. But, but come on, heckling, jeering, it's part of the deal. There's a really good chance that that East Carolina will be all of that, and not hear a swear word the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even know how bad it can get when you don't go there. Yeah, we're not BYU just... fans, for the most part, don't go there. Yeah, there will be no burritos thrown at ECU's players. <laughs> just looking at you, Georgia Southern. Yeah. And no one's throwing <laughs> cougar tails or two. No. I can throw those. Yeah, listen, BYU fans want to destroy your football team, and then they'll give you free ice cream in the fourth quarter. Yeah. It's all good. Fantastic. According to multiple Twitter reports, Dave, BYU basketball beat Stanford in a secret scrimmage over the weekend. My question is, can BYU football make it 2-0 and against the Cardinal in essentially a month? You know what? Here's the thing. In the scrimmages, there's no fans or media allowed in. In the game down there at the farm, 20,000 BYU fans will be there. Come on, descend so on yes, the farm. BYU can beat them down there. 
and I expect them to, it'll make for a great Thanksgiving weekend, just like they did when they went over to USC and sure. beat the Trojans last year. Now here's the good news for BYU's defense against Stanford's offense when we're talking football. Stanford does not have an explosive offense. That bodes well for a defense that's looking for confidence and has struggled, right? That said, it's a road game. Might be in the afternoon. I don't know. We'll see. But BYU is absolutely capable of beating a team like Stanford in the regular season absolutely. finale. Absolutely. They, are, they are capable of doing that. Should have beat Notre Dame, and then Stanford beat Notre Dame. I'm like, well, BYU should beat both those teams. For sure. Yeah. All right, they say timing's everything, and Spencer at last night's blue-white game, you <laughs> proved that that was true with your interview with Andy and Holly Toulson. Let's listen. As his mom, what's what's the best advice you can give to a kid that's transitioning to college into the Division One life of a basketball player? Just take it one day at a time. Don't get too impatient. Do your time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the shots will fall. They really will. Just take it at a time. Quite literally, the shots will fall. I think you are the good. This was all meant to be, right? Meant to be for sure. Yeah, Tanner loves this, so he's gonna be excited that we're on TV. I don't know. I appreciate that you planned. Did you plan that? Well, I had a good feeling when Tanner put on that <laughs> white jersey and switched from the blue team to the white team. He recruited. He got, a, he got an IL and went to the other team. <laughs> yeah, they, he won that game. No, he, he hit a three right before we went to the Toulson, so you had the perfect toss over to me, and then he made another three while I was interviewing. That, that's exactly how I planned it to be, Dave. It's so good to have the Toulsons back and have another yeah, one on the floor. For sure. Jimmer Fredette's going to play for Team USA and their three-on-three -three team in the America Cup. The three-on-three -three team did not qualify for the Tokyo Olympics, so will Jimmer be the face for U.S. basketball and their three-on-three -three squad as a redeemed team in 2024? Absolutely. Absolutely. Spread the floor. No one, no one guy can guard Jimmer. You can just do whatever he wants. Can you imagine watching Jimmer Fredette compete for a gold medal? Like, that's an Olympic story dream for Bob Costas and Mike Tirico and all those guys. I'd actually watch that Olympic event. <laughs> I think it can happen, and uh, that, that would be, you can't guard him. Gold in 2024. <laughs> BYU women's basketball opens their season with an exhibition game tonight against Westminster. It'll be the first time since 2001 that a Cougar women's hoops team takes the floor without Jeff Judkins at the helm. Strange. So how much pressure do you think Amber Whiting's feeling this morning? Well, I know that she's feeling some pressure. Yeah. That said, it's an exhibition, so I, I think she's just excited to figure out what she has. Yeah. You know, and so I think she's more excited than she is feeling pressure for this specific game. She knows she has an elite rebounder, and I think that will help every coach. Certainly. It was reported that Denver Broncos quarterback Russell Wilson worked out on his team's airplane in the aisle for four hours of the flight to London. Four hours. While his teammates slept, or at least <laughs> tried to sleep. Dave, what would you do if Blaine Fowler worked out for four hours while you tried to sleep on an intercontinental flight? First thing I'd do is I'd wake up, I'd get my laptop out, and then I'd go to, say, The Gap, and I would order some adult-sized shirts for him. <laughs> Since he likes to wear kid shirts so his guns look bigger. Brian Logan does the same thing. So then I'd do that, and if I couldn't go back to sleep, I would say, for the love. I'm going to first class. Yes. I'll see you when we land. But... Yeah, I, I, you know what? We learned some things about athletes like Russell Wilson here, and you're just like, I don't know. When did that seem like a good idea? They're marching to the beat of his own drum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Broncos paid a lot of money for I guess they're probably happy he's doing that. Women's Hoops, as mentioned. <laughs> Exhibition tonight, 9 Eastern, on the BYU TV app with Spencer and Kristen Kozlowski. On the call, be fun to watch the Cougars tonight. Get Blaine an extra large shirt. <laughs> Emily Astle and Bobo Huang doing great things for BYU women's tennis. They're on their way to nationals. And it's been a while since we sent a team there. Let's find out what's been going on. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. <laughs> Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation live in Studio B. Alongside Dave McCann, I'm Spencer Linton, and it's my pleasure to welcome in the BYU women's dynamic duo from the tennis squad, Emily Assel and Yuja Bobo Huang. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We love having big shots on the show. <laughs> Do you feel like big shots? <laughs> kind of. This whole setup. <laughs> hey, let's never, look, never done anything like this before. You, you have absolutely earned this, both of you. Uh, for the first time since 2006, we have a BYU women's duo qualifying for nationals. So first and foremost, congratulations on getting to nationals. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So which player carries the other player during these matches? Bobo. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great answer. <laughs> Now, Bobo, you are the one that's 10 and 0, right? Because Emily, you did, now correct me if I'm wrong, yes. you had to sit out three matches. So, Bobo, you're 10 and 0 in yep. the duos uh, scenario, and you're 7 and 0. Is that yep. right? So, by nature, are you like, are you the number one in this duo? Um, probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, no. That's great. Emily, why does this duo work so well together? Um, I just think we have great energy together. Like, we both want to win so bad. And when we go out on the court, we're just so excited. We build each other up. Just the energy is really good, really fun. You've got to trust each other, too, to, to be where you need to be. We've been talking about the football team and this new basketball team, and half the battle is trusting that your teammate is going to do their part, and all you have to do is focus on yours, and then together you create the chemistry to make it work. Yeah. yeah. Is that definitely. how that goes down? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? What, in your opinion, Bobo, what, what is the best thing that you two do together on a tennis court? Um, one thing I just felt like Emily likes um, have a great serve, behind and then I just love to being at the net and I felt like that was great between both of us and which is a huge part in doubles I felt like. Okay so you're the net expert <laughs> and you're the service specialist. There we go yeah. I love it. So Emily let me get this straight you're, you're in your piano lesson <laughs> when you're 10 and there's there's two roads here like like a piano teacher for me would just say get out <laughs> but for you they said hey you should try tennis. Yeah, um, my piano teacher growing up, both of her daughters played collegiate tennis. Yeah. So I just started taking lessons from them. And then, yeah, just went from there. And it's been so fun. Well, and your dad played basketball at mm -hmm. BYU. Yeah, he But did. at this point, because you qualify for nationals now, are you the best Astel to compete <laughs> for BYU athletics? I don't know. I've actually never seen him play. I've never seen the film of that. I'll have to go back and watch him play. But... <laughs> You know what? There is film of it. If he says he's too old, there's no film of it. There is film of it. We'll track it down. We'll track it down that. somewhere and throw it up on YouTube for sure. Bobo, what does it feel like to represent BYU in um, your sport? I just felt like really exciting when I first know that we qualifying to this um, national tournaments. Just um, really exciting. Looking forward to compete against other great teams and. Yeah, just another chance to learn, I felt like. First time in 16 years, again, that we've sent a women's duo to nationals. So uh, for those that aren't aware of, of what happens in nationals and the type of teams you're going to be uh, facing and how many teams qualify, what, like what type of uh, an, a tournament are we talking about? Yeah, um, I think it's a draw of 32. Um, just all the best teams around the nation, all the teams that won their regional tournaments. And so... Like Bubba said, yeah, it's just a super exciting opportunity to see how we match up against them. I think we can do really well, so we're mm -hmm. both really excited. When you're walking across campus, and what do we have, like 36,000 students now on campus, and you're walking past everybody, do you want to say, hey, going to nationals? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why you're here. That's why you're here. We're putting it on film, if you will. We're sending it out on Twitter and Instagram. We've got to bring some more attention to this. Yeah. It's really um, exciting. So you're in Vegas at regionals, right? Mm hmm How how does a BYU duo celebrate qualifying for nationals in <laughs> Vegas? We I felt like um I didn't really know that we are well when we won that match that we are going to a national. Like we just uh, we just didn't know that it's happening, but like two days after, um, we just like we're going to national, and then it's like we're just like so pumped and exciting. Like, yeah, just cannot believe that just happened. So you found out two days after the fact. Uh, uh, yeah. When well, when we were there, I thought that the winner of regionals was the only team that qualified for nationals. Okay. okay. So when we won our semifinals match, I didn't realize, or I don't think either yeah. of us realized that we were going to nationals. And the final of regionals was on Sunday. So we weren't going to be able to play the finals. So we were both just kind of nervous because we didn't know what would happen. And then when we found out that both the finalists and the final um, made it to nationals, we were both super, super excited. Wow. That's awesome. When and where are That's you going to awesome. compete next? Um, and how can BYU fans support you in this and watch and be involved? Yeah, so it's, we leave on Monday. We're going to San Diego. The tournament starts on Wednesday. Um, and I think there's live streaming and stuff on the website, but yeah. We'll oh, we'll, oh, we'll find it. Yeah. We'll, we'll find it for sure. 
<laughs> and make sure all of our VOA fans know about that. Congratulations yeah. again to both of you. Um, here's how it works when you come on the show. Because you're great athletes, you're on the show. But we give you BYU Sports Nation karma, and it's going to take your levels up just a little oh, bit. We it's, love that. It's a we real need thing. it. We're excited. It's a real thing. It's, it's, we've documented this over nine years. <laughs> like, it's strangely real. So enjoy the karma. Congratulations to both of you. Can't wait to watch you compete in San Diego. Well done. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. Thanks for Thanks being for here. Thanks for having us. All right. Luck. Emily Aslan and Bobo Huang of BYU Women's Tennis. Fantastic stuff. Earlier, we talked about the, uh, our, our football squad getting ready for game day on BYU TV. Here's a pitch for our radio guys, Greg Rubel, Riley Nelson, Jason Shepard, Mitch Jurgens. They fire up their coverage for tomorrow's BYU East Carolina game at 6 Eastern over on BYU Radio. Plus, why I'm a little bit concerned about my job status after last night. Post game with Rudy was epic. He took over. Should I be updating my LinkedIn? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Nation's on demand. Download the free BYU TV and BYU radio apps or listen to the podcast, subscribe, rate, and please review. Our question of the day is this. Does BYU football need to beat East Carolina on Friday night to feel comfortable about making a bowl game appearance? It's a good question. It is. In response, our elite voice of the day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated at Cosmo underscore duh underscore cougar says comfortable is the right word. Beating ECU would be the football equivalent of finally getting that royal blue snuggie I've had my eye on since 2006. You just want to snug, you want to snuggle up and feel comfortable in a royal blue snuggie Look, after BYU beats ECU. The low Friday night's 27 degrees. <laughs> Get the snuggie. Get does, the snuggie. Now, does Blaine have a jacket that will fit around his guns <laughs> to keep him warm? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be a little cool for our postgame show. Yes, it will. It's our first taste of that stuff since, since last year. We've been spoiled with weather this year. Yeah. So this is the first real kind of inclement weather, if you will, that BYU has dealt with. <laughs> we'll baby Blaine through it. <laughs> Today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. And after what he did last night in the postgame of the Blue-Eyed Scrimmage, this is naturally going to Rudy Williams, because post-game with Rudy is now apparently a thing. It is a thing. Thanks to Mark Pope and his transfer point guard from Coastal Carolina. Listen to this. If you missed the interviews last night, Rudy took over the mic. 6'5", sharp shooting, athletic wing, Tanner Toulson. How would you grade our team's performance tonight? Which team? The team <laughs> as a whole. The winning team, I mean, the winning team played great. We played, uh, we played fast. We played... Uh, Better than the blue team, what can I say? Mind you, Tanner did switch teams at halftime <laughs> due to unfortunate circumstances. But nonetheless, he did end up on the winning side. I will say the blue team played a little bit better the first half. Although we were making a comeback and they said switch to jersey and then, and then we just had to finish the game off. So are you the reason why that we had to put the game away when you came to white? No, no, no. That's a team effort, but I'm saying I... It, it might what have, a humble guy. It might have helped. <laughs> All right, thank you, Tanner. Get to the locker room. Let's go. <laughs> Rudy Williams, yeah. post-game with Rudy. Uh, his, his interview with Atiki was really good. He did one with Trey Stewart as well. I there guess. are some personalities yes. on this team that yes. I think fans will find endearing. Now, Rudy, Rudy's got to go out and get 16 points a game. That's, that's, you know, that's what he got at Coastal. He, he's come here for a reason. He's a leader. He's got to distribute the basketball, but he also has to score. There's no Alex Barcelo for the first game ever for Mark Pope at BYU as head coach, there was no Alex Barcelo last Sure. Year. But there's now a Rudy Williams. I'll tell you what, I observed a lot more vocal coaching from the players than I have in um, the last year. And I know every team's different. And Alex was the leader, but Alex was not super vocal. Rudy is vocal. Yeah. I mean, he's coaching the entire time out in the huddle. And there are a bunch of guys that all like are fierce competitors on this team. He had a couple of step back threes. He took it. Uh, he's got the ability to get right to the rim. Uh, Rudy, Rudy's going to be the the nucleus of this squad, I think, and uh, I think fans are going to love him, uh, and they'll love him more if he's averaging 16 points a game, or maybe a little bit more. And then, I, and then Foose, of course, everybody knows. Foose was kind of quiet last night, but he knows what he can do. 
Hey, we are in the midst of a very, very busy week of BYU yeah. sports. Uh, six home games this week between the Blue White Scrimmage, women's basketball tonight, women's volleyball tonight, and Saturday, football against ECU, and then a huge match for soccer on Saturday night. This is, this is a massive week for BYU athletics. And you know what, fans? It is so nice to have a BYU TV to show it to you. I, I just, we were thinking about it last night. It is so cool to have the tools, the toys, and the access to do what we do, and this is a big week to show that. This is what we do. Our thanks to today's guest, Hans Olsen, and the duo of BYU Women's Tennis, Emily Assel and Bobo Huang. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, this and all our shows are on demand at BYUSN.com. For Dave, I'm Spencer. Shout out to Alan Astle. We'll see you tonight for BYU Women's Volleyball on the app at 9 Eastern. Go Cougs!